I want to introduce briefly our speakers. They have long resumes, but I'm going to make this short. Dr. Barron is board certified in internal medicine and geriatric medicine, and he's the president and CEO of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the ABIM Foundation. Dr. Barron practiced general internal medicine and geriatrics for almost 30 years in greenhouse internists located in his neighborhood in Philadelphia and was a pioneer in the EMR, particularly in small practices. Dr. Nudi is a primary care physician, technologist, and business leader who serves as the chief medical officer for Accolade, which delivers personalized navigation and population health services to companies that cover over 2 million working Americans. He practices as a primary care physician in the greater uh, Washington, D.C. area and serves as a senior advisor to the World Bank and a lecturer in health policy at the George Washington. We met Shot, I met Shot Nu when he was leading an organization called the Human Diagnostic Project. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the conversation by using this chat function again, as well as during the live q and I'll turn this over to our speakers. Thank you, Shot Nu, and thank you, Dr. Barron. Thanks, Daniel. I appreciate the introduction and uh, thanks, Sean Mu. I know you have a lot of things going on in your life and to find time for this conversation, uh, very much appreciate it. And uh, as Daniel said, um, we're going to focus on uh, the importance of trust at both the doctor patient and the organization level. And, um, and I think it's never a bad idea when uh, we physicians are talking about um, any aspect of doing medicine to start with patients and start with, we're also influenced by and should be uh, our, our experience doing patient care. You're still doing patient care. Um, it, is there a particular patient story either from your uh, patient care world or from your uh, experience at uh, Accolade that comes to mind when you think about the importance of trust? And I'll invite you to take it. There you go. Good. Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity, Dr. Barron and, and Daniel, for the nice introduction. This is such an important conversation. So it's absolutely worth our time to talk about, I think, one of the most foundational aspects of, of medicine. Um, so for me, the, the story that comes to mind, uh, and I agree, the stories are super powerful way to start, is uh, actually a, a patient we help take care of uh, at Accolade. So just as quick context, Accolade, uh, basically works with Americans around the country, giving them a personal health assistant, sort of, I like to joke sometimes like a travel agent for your healthcare who can help you manage the complexity of our healthcare system that I think is a huge proximal driver of a lot of the poor outcomes that we see. And so one of the stories was, um, uh, there was this, this, this gentleman who were taking care of in Southwest US who, um, one day sent a message. We have like a 24 seven messaging service. It sent a basically a secure message to one of our nurses saying, uh, I need help now. And when our nurse called uh, very quickly uh, to, the, to the member, what we learned was that uh, this gentleman had actually uh, attempted to commit suicide. And he was now very scared uh, and she kept him on the phone, kept him talking. Turns out he shared what where he was, what hotel, what hotel room, and we were able to activate EMS and get EMS in time to be able to get him to the ER and, and, and get him safe. And a few months later, uh, we got another message that said, you know, I've hit rock bottom. And you know, again, we reached out and it turned out that the broader story was he's been, he dealt with alcoholism for years and he was ready to go into rehab, but he had to go today. And of course it was, you know, Friday afternoon, <laughs> just as rehab centers around the country are closing. But anyways, our team went into action, found uh, a rehab facility amazingly in the same area, uh, uh, was able to get the appeal through so that, cause it was out of network. And then this gentleman, because of his alcoholism had pushed away a lot of the people in his life. He actually didn't have a way to even get there. And it was very far away, like an hour, I believe. So, our nurse actually paid out of uh, her own pocket for uh, a, a cab fare to get that member there. And um, the patient, you know, went through, got, you know, went through rehab and, and became sober. And 
to me, it's such a powerful story. In fact, actually, one of the most interesting parts of the story is the way it started, the way this relationship was created was, uh, was actually before all this, they met through the phone when this patient was actually going through open enrollment, which is, you know, that annual process where you got to pick your insurance company or benefits. That's how they met. And somehow this, this nurse was able to build such a strong, trusting relationship that in that moment where this person committed suicide, the, the first person he thought about reaching out to was this nurse that he met on an open enrollment call over the phone. And I think that to me really illustrates how trust can be a lifeline for people. Well, I, that really is an extraordinary story. And, and there are a lot of moving parts in that story. There's there's the system capacity to uh, be able to staff those phone lines, to uh, commandeer transportation resources, to find uh, uh, treatment centers on Friday afternoon. Somehow it's always Friday afternoon, right? In clinical practice, that's, that's oh. always when it is, always. Absolutely. Uh, but but I, I think there's something, I guess I'd want to start in the place, I, I know many people on the call may not be familiar with accolade, um, and, and in that sense, um, the, the people that you're serving probably aren't familiar with accolade either. And yet you find yourself needing to create relationships with a group of people who don't recognize your brand, don't know who you are, uh, don't know why they should even be talking to whoever it is they're talking to when, they, when they're uh, in touch with accolade. Can you talk some about um, how that has shaped your approach to hiring, to staffing, to training, um, how do you how do you get past that uh, initial barrier of um, who are you? Yeah, no, it's it's a profound question. You know, I, I often have this moment when I'm in clinic, when I'm taking care of my patients, where I realize that uh, I'm able to borrow so much of the trust that has has been bestowed to doctors and healthcare systems over decades, if not centuries. Right. Like I work at a largely immigrant community where a lot of them step stand up when I walk in the room, if you if you remember that feeling. And uh, and I always think, well, I didn't do anything to deserve that. Um, and there's still more we needed to do there. And I know we'll talk about that. But at Accolade, you're right. We don't have that. I mean, people don't know what Accolade is. We're not a clinic or a hospital that's respected by the and understood by the community. And the person who picks up the phone is this person that we call a health assistant. It's not a nurse who obviously has super high respect in our, in our country and physicians, this is a health assistant. And so we haven't been able to, to leverage that trusting relationship and that, that sort of brand, if you would. And so we've had to build it on our own and you're right. It, it's a whole system. So it starts with when we re recruit, we actually recruit explicitly for empathy. That's a, that's a key criteria. Um, and into how we, we, we find people. I mean, a lot of the people that are health assistants, some are social workers, some, or baristas, some were teachers, but the, the, the commonality isn't their expertise or their skill set. We give that to them. And with the technology, it's actually that we're really hiring for empathy. The training. So what's really cool, and I can't take any credit for this, is that um, Ackley was started with a very strong behavioral science model. In fact, they felt that the existing models, like for example, motivational interviewing were good, but insufficient. And so they actually created their own uh, influence model. Um, that we call LEARN2. Uh, so LEARN2 is an acronym. It stands for listen, engage, assess, resolve, influence, and enhance. And, and that model is very deep in our cultural DNA. It's deep in our training. And I'll give you an example of where it plays out. So one of the most common phone calls we get actually is, hey, I've lost my, my ID card, my insurance card, right? Like we've all had that happen to us, right? So we get that call. And, you know, of course, on that call, people aren't ready to talk about their health care or their clinical problems. They just want to get their card and move on their way. Right. And so the challenge for our teams is how do you, you know, get someone that card really fast? But then, you know, well, why is it that you're getting a member ID card? Right. Because you might have lost it two months ago. But why today? Why do you want it today? Well, guess oh. what? Most people are about to go to the ER. They're about to go to the hospital, the, the clinic. They want to make an appointment. So our teams are taught. Actually, the phrase we use is fearless questions. So we're they're asked to, to, to ask a fearless question, give them the card and say, hey, can I ask you like in a really neutral way, why do you need the card? Like what's going on, right? And then the person will say, well, I broke my arm. Okay, well, tell me about that, right? And so it's that learn to model and it's that focus on, 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 on empathy 
Um, and then the last part I'll, I'll sort of add is that our calls are recorded like a lot of places are, but they're specifically reviewed um, in order to continue to assess for those core components of that learn to model. So there's a feedback mechanism that's also really important on an ongoing basis. So I, really interesting to hear you talk about the centrality of empathy. And um, again, as you said, you're in a setting now where you don't have a lot of the things that you're able to leverage when you're working in the community health center or the hospital or some of the listeners on this call have when they're in their healthcare related institutions. Um, talk to me about how you, how you scale screening for empathy. Uh, what's, the, what's the approach? How do you figure out uh, who's empathic and who's not, uh, even at the hiring stage? Yeah, no, it's, 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 you're right. It's a great question. To give you a sense of scale, you know, we're now up to like 2,200 employees. And I think every year, you know, we bring on, you know, four to 500 new frontline care team members, including health systems. So we are operating now at a certain level of scale. Um, and, and I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of components, but to me, actually, interestingly enough, the most important component, is more like culture. You know, it's, we kind of, at this point, when you have a, a more senior health, uh, health assistant or a more senior nurse who's been here for a while, and they're then interviewing the next crop, because we've sort of built that DNA, I guess, in them and in what they see in their teams, it's much more of a, hey, does this person belong here? Does this person have the same sort of, uh, uh, sort of a core principles? You know, there's a lot of diversity, but core principles behind how they think about the importance of service, how they think about um, you know, uh, how they relate to people, how they think about um, sort of uh, the level of you know, paternalism versus you know, collaboration that they exhibit. Um, that's the early part. And then through the process, there's actually uh, uh, simulation. So there's actually conversations that they'll participate in. And then even when we hire them, the training period is actually an exploratory period. And so there's an opportunity to actually have them sit in front of a room, if you remember from med school with like two people, and that's actually used to decide if there's a mutual fit. Um, hmm. And there's a pretty non, non-zero percentage of people who even at that later stage, we don't love it, but even at that later stage uh, isn't a fit for the sort of em empathetic teams we're trying to build here. Wow. I mean, it, it really, um, I think everybody on this call is connected to a healthcare organization and uh, when we're hiring, um, we're looking for skills, uh, we're looking for uh, resume credentials, background, training, education. Uh, I doubt many of us um, centralize looking for empathy and take seriously um, how to try to identify when it's present and not. Uh, if you have any parting summary words before we move on from uh, empathy to some other aspects of of how you do this, I, it really might be helpful uh, for people to hear, how do you think about something like empathy when you're hiring 2,200 employees? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I have a lot more wisdom, but I think what I will say is, you know, I sometimes joke only half jokingly that the most important person at my clinic is my front desk staff, right? Um, because, right, like they're the first person that a patient in need talks to. Uh, they decide if someone gets an appointment today or can wait a few days, right? Like they're the ones who often book in the relationship. And I think part of, I think what I've learned and I'm trying to bring back into healthcare is that, is that yeah, those people matter and all the interactions of those people uh, create matter. And I think that when you think about the end experience for your patient, right? They may spend as much time talking to your billing office or your front desk scheduling person as they would will with the medical assistant or with the physician, you know, and that end-to-end -end experience, um, it, you know, they look at all of that as part of the clinic. They don't think, oh, that was just the front desk person, but the doctor was really nice. It's like, that's their experience. That's their lived experience through the whole process. And so I just think right. that, um, and it's high leverage, right? If you, even if you're a fee-for-service clinic and you care about volume, maybe how that person answers the phone and how they, they create a, a, a space for that person to share their concerns and then schedule actually is a, is a pretty significant part of your business, uh, whether or not you fully appreciate that. Oh, for sure. No, I think that's absolutely true. And, uh, and, I, and I think that when we are in clinical settings and we find 
that people who are on the front desk are not um, doing that. It, it's incumbent on us to, to really call it out through whatever channel we can, um, because you're right, that that is where the relationships begin and that is the, the patient's overall experience. So I'm curious, you, you talk about leveraging the, the sort of trust that your community health center has, that people might have in a hospital, people might have in a traditional healthcare provider, and you're coming at this at, at Accolade from a completely different, you don't have that background. It, right. Is that better or worse these days? I mean, do, do you think that you have an advantage not being associated with the employer who hired you or the insurance company who hired you or, uh, or the health system that, that may be caring? Um, is that, how do you think that that's playing these days? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really important point. I mean, a lot of times, for better or worse, we borrow the, the, the trust that come with the institutions and the relationships that those institutions have. Right. Like I think about my clinic when we did the vaccine rollout, the fact that we partnered with the church, right? We were able to borrow sort of the incredible amount of trust that that church has with their community. Um, and so you're right. In fact, you know, when we talk to employers and they say, well, why did you switch to Accolade or, or add Accolade to your insurance uh, benefits? People said, frankly, you know, patients, even though insurance companies have changed a lot, like, um, people just don't trust opening up in that way with their insurance company. Um, and on the other side, you know, um, you know, as you know, a lot of employers are really interested in mental health and uh, they're, they're getting much more focused on it, especially post pandemic, but, and, and a lot of employers have this thing called EAP, you know, employer assistance programs where, you know, a lot of employers, you can talk about whatever issues you're having, but a, a huge challenge they deal with is engagement. And when we ask people, they'll say, yeah, because on some level, I understand the data is, is, is in a different part of the system. And I know that my manager can't access that, but like, it's still part of my employer, right? And, I, you know, I need this job. And so you're right that the fact that we are our own entity, not an insurance company, not an employer, even though it comes with challenges, comes with some, I guess, less, uh, I guess, baggage, if you would, um, that we're able to, to sort of start Tabula Rasa and create a trusting relationship from. Right. Well, I guess another thing that, that you may do, Tabula Rasa, um, the whole issue of measurement, um, which kind of was imported late into healthcare. I, I think it's the subject of enduring shame for those of us in clinical medicine that, that the HEDIS measures, uh, which my colleague Dan Wolfson was involved in, in developing, uh, I, I, very few uh, people, even in the quality movement, could tell you that that acronym stands for the Health Insurer Employer Data Information Set. There weren't any clinician in that. It, it was insurance companies and, and employers. And I think that, um, that they, they understood that they could create numerator and denominator data because of the kind of access to data they had. Mm. And I think it's still, um, it's still been an uneasy uneasy marriage, uneasy union between the idea of using data uh, to improve care, uh, which is, is sort of foundational to the world we're living in. But I, I think many, many frontline clinicians believe the data are being used to punish them or uh, to somehow judge them unfairly. But you, you're growing up in something of a startup uh, on that tabula rasa. Uh, what kind of data did you decide that it was important to measure to see whether you were achieving these kinds of trust building goals? Yeah, yeah, such an important question. It's actually funny when I, you know, I'm, I'm new to the employer space myself. It's only been a couple of years and, and only been an actually couple of years. But when I joined, you know, I'd be in these management meetings where I'd be very intimidated. So very, very smart uh, folks in the room. And here I am, the, the doctor in the room. And they kept saying, ASA, ASA, ASA. And I said, why are we talking about aspirin? <laughs> you know, thinking about the salicylic acid. And, and, and ASA is average speed of answer uh, for those of you that haven't worked in a, a, a service oriented business. And, 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 it's, and it's so important. I mean, average speed of answer, right? What is that? That is how long does it take you to get a human being on the phone when someone calls your health system or organization? Right. The other one we talk a lot about is abandonment rate, which again, I thought initially I was like, well, are these people abandoning their, their children or their spouses? Like, no, abandonment rate is when someone calls, what percent of the time before it gets to a human being does the person hang up the phone? 
right? Um, and then we talked about CSAT, 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 which, you know, it's not the satellite system, it's customer satisfaction. And so uh, those are our, our vital metrics. I mean, like literally it's presented at every single conversation we have. And what's really interesting too, I mean, we don't, you know, to always talk about payment and stuff, but, you know, Accolade as a business, you know, we get, we get paid by employers a certain amount per month. Uh, employees, it's free and their families. But if you take our fees, a third of those fees are at risk. And what's really interesting is a third of that third is on total cost of care, which is common in the industry. But the other two thirds, one third of that is on, is on engagement. Like what percent of the population do we actually touch in any given year? And the other third is, is on a combination of, of ASA as average speed of answer, customer satisfaction, or a net promoter score, which is another sort of way that people measure how much people love a service. And I think that's actually really powerful, you know, because as I think about the shift to value-based care, like, yes, it's great. We want a lower healthcare cost. We want care to be more affordable, clearly. Yes, we want quality to improve, but we also want to treat people right. Um, and I think you can save money and you can improve quality without necessarily treating people well. And so these are sort of related but orthogonal measures of quality, right? So I want my satisfaction to be really high. I want my and more, net promoter score to be high, right? Uh, and, and, and frankly, we think we should be engaging a significant portion of the population. Like that's just, you can't help people unless you're talking to them. And so it just really rang true, but it's also an example of where, yes, you can have a great culture, you can have great training that builds trustworthiness, but if fundamentally it's not a business driver or an organizational driver, if you're a nonprofit, I think it, you know, on some level, it may not continue to be an ongoing concern um, simply because of how incentives, you know, in organizations work. Right. And I think there's a hugely powerful lesson here for existing legacy organizations, because when you, when you talk about those scores and you talk about the way they're used, they, they really flow from a conceptual model, a logic model of what are you trying to do and how would you know if you did it and, mm. and how, you know, you're, you're really constructing a sense of, well, we, you know, if, we, if we're, if we're going to run a call center, uh, if, if it takes us a long time to answer the phone, uh, we're not going to service as many people as if we don't. And it, it's pretty basic. And I think in clinical medicine, um, we, we often miss those opportunities to, to have a conversation about well, what are we trying to achieve when we go to work um, as a group, as a team? How would we know if we achieved those things? And I think there, there are vast opportunities uh, beyond HEDIS measures and, and beyond meaningful use measures and beyond a lot of the numerator denominator measures that hit people. Um, and, and I think the uh, one of the exhilarating things about um, for you, I guess, in being in a new space is you, you have new definitions of success and, um, and, and you were involved in helping to craft them and, and trying to figure out um, how, to, how to make them. And they, and they have um, validity for you. They, they don't feel like you're being unfairly judged. They, they feel like they're telling you something about how successfully you're conducting the business you're trying to conduct. And that's a great place to be. Well, if I could shift, if I could shift gears a little bit, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, so somewhere between uh, being at the World Bank or while you were at the World Bank or being a father or taking this job at Accolade, you managed to write a book, um, which always impresses me when people find the time and focus to do it. Uh, and, and your book is called Care After COVID. And you talk about um, the three characteristics of what you think healthcare is going to look like after COVID, that it'll be distributed, that it'll be digitally enabled, and that it'll be decentralized. Each one of those things creates what I'll call trust challenges. And by the way, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, I thought it was a terrific book. I, I really admire uh, Dr. Nundi's ability to imagine a future and um, support it with just enough evidence of what's happening in the present to believe we could really get there. It's a wonderfully optimistic book. And, um, and in that sense, it, it really is a gift. But can you talk some about what do you think happens to trust uh, and the challenges that trust faces for care that's distributed, for care that's digitally enabled and for care that's decentralized? Yeah, yeah. Well, well first, let, let me just take one of those to, as a starting point, right? I mean, so distributed is this idea that, you know, that care should start where health happens, right? So 
Today, care typically starts the moment you walk into a clinic, walk into a hospital. Distributed is saying we need to distribute care from those sort of fixed facilities into the community, into where people are literally. And, and that's encompassing of, it could be virtual, it could be home-based, it could be community-based, but all those things are a way to distribute um, you know, care so that you know, it's truly meeting people where they are. And so when I think about distributed, as the first one in your question about trust, like to me, I, I actually think it's really foundational for trust, right? Because you know, we talk about you know, meeting people where they are, and sometimes we do that in somewhat of a vague way, but I think distributed is saying, no, 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 like actually meet them where they are. You know, and for some people, and the reason I prefer distributed to maybe virtual or home is, is, you know, some people are online, so let's go meet them online. As we know, a lot of people, particularly our most disenfranchised, aren't online, so they might be in churches, they might be in barbershops. And of course, for a lot of our older folks, they might be at home, but regardless, meet people in, in, in their contacts, and that's really powerful. I mean, it harkens back to, you know, sort of Marcus Welby and sort of some of the origins uh, of, of medicine, but... I think what you quickly learn, like even for me, when I was doing virtual visits this past year, you know, some patients that I've been taking care of for years, suddenly just seeing that little box behind them, right? I, I, I got to see, you know, the, the, you know, their kids, or I got to see the scribbles on the wall, or I got to see the, the older adult that they're taking care of. And I think that's a really important part of trustworthiness is like, you know me, you understand me. Um, and things that sometimes we have to screen for with like a questionnaire, like, oh, do you smoke? Do you this? Do you that? Hits you over the head when you're in someone's house and you can smell the cigarette smoke and you can see that the, the 10 steps up to their house and you can see the unsafe neighborhood that they live in. And so um, I think the act of meeting people where they are and then also being able to, to understand their lived experience um, is it has great potential in distributed care across its forms. Uh, that's certainly profound. And I have a colleague who in doing video visits uh, invites the patients to do a house tour at the beginning of a visit, show me where you live, you know, walk around, uh, um, you know, use the, uh, so turning that into some version of distributed care. And of course, digitally enabled, uh, people are, are um, very skeptical and a little suspicious of digital technologies. Thoughts on how you enhance trust or or support trust in a digital environment? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to me, trust is so much about relationships, right? And so when I say digitally enabled, to clarify, like digitally enabled means really using data and technology to strengthen the relationships that we have, right? So, you know, for example, when I text my wife, it's not my way of, you know, minimizing my relationship with her or whatnot. It's a way that throughout the day, we can stay in touch with each other and reinforce, right? Uh, the reasons that uh, we're together. And, and I think that that's what I think a lot about when I think about digital enablement is the white noise, right? You see your doctor in this incredibly intense 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute experience. And then you go three months, six months, nine months with a whole bunch of homework to do and, and white noise, right? And so for me, you know, um, that ability to continue to engage with that person and continue to reinforce, that's the really powerful thing. I mean, even during the pandemic, I'll tell you the silliest thing. You know, uh, in our clinic, we elected to use, you know, FaceTime and WhatsApp uh, uh, on, our, on our phones because our, our patients can't afford software and we can't either. But what's interesting is because I was WhatsApping and FaceTiming them, I actually had their cell phone numbers, right? And so a lot of times they would just text me afterward and say, you know, thanks so much for your advice with that, you know, or they'd ask me a question and I'd say something and then I'd get an emoji back. And that was like the best, you know, I never got an emoji as a doctor before. Right. So, and I really felt those things, you know, built my relationship, built that trust that, Hey, when you message me, I'll respond. You're kind of getting to know me. It's more informal. And I don't know, there was something to that, uh, uh, that I think was really powerful. Right. No, for sure. And, um, as you say, there, it becomes tools of connection digitally enabled, uh, a, a, a critical, critical way to understand it. And then uh, decentralized, you know, we do have uh, brands associated with healthcare institutions and in good and bad uh, around the country. How do you think you transition to a decentralized trust framework? 
Yeah, so decentralized is the most sort of, I think, difficult for folks to rock their head around. So let me um, sort of maybe give an example. So uh, uh, there was this elderly uh, African-American female I was taking care of a few years ago who was you know, in and out of the hospital with heart failure, right? And, and after one of these visits, um, uh, you know, I, I you know, gently scold her. I said, remember, check your weight. And if your weight, weight weight's up a couple of pounds, give me a call and you know, we could maybe increase your medications. And I don't know what got over me that day, but it occurred to me that maybe she didn't have a weighing scale. So I kind of went back in and said, do you have a weighing scale? And, you know, she looks at the ground uh, and she goes, no, Dr. Nundi, I don't, I can't afford one. Right. Um, and of course I felt like an idiot at that moment. So I went running around the clinic looking for one. We didn't have one. Uh, so I ended up handing her just $20 out of my pocket. She got a weighing scale and never got admitted again. And, um, and we all have that story. Like it's not like that. Everyone has that story, whether it's the carpets clean, the inhaler, the, you know, everyone has that story who practices medicine um, and is part of healthcare. But the, the reason why I think that that's such an important, you know, story for me when I think about decentralized is, you know, ultimately like the solution to that problem isn't to get everyone a weighing scale, right? That's not what everybody needs. The solution is to put the resources in the hands of, you know, frontline providers and patients to decide how to best steward the healthcare resources we have, right? Like she had Medicare. I could have gotten her a cardiac cath for the low, low price of $5,000, right? I could have gotten her, you know, admitted to the hospital for three days for a heart failure workup, but I couldn't get her a $20, uh, you know, weighing scale. And, and, and the, the, the thing is some patients need A, some patients need B, some patients need C, but who knows? Well, the provider and the patient know. And so I think that's what I mean by decentralized. And I think it, it, I think harkens back to, to, to trust very directly. Right. Because again, it's saying, I understand you. Um, and I'm actually going to solve your problem. It's not like, well, Hey, you need a weighing scale. I'm not really sure where you go for that. It's really owning that relationship with that person and owning the solution and, and, and having that sort of shared, uh, accountability and shared resources that I think is really powerful. All right. Great. I'm going to make one last shift to talk about health equity, but before yeah. I do, I want to invite people to uh, either type questions into the chat because after this segment of our conversation, it'll revert, it, it not revert, it will, we will pass the baton to the audience to uh, talk to you or me about what, what is on their mind. But um, obviously the, the pandemic has revealed um, some dramatic uh, issues of inequitable outcomes have amplified the impact of structural racism, have made uh, visible um, so much of the uh, of the equity challenge we face in this country. Um, do you have thoughts on how uh, either your thinking in the book or the accolade business model uh, can come together to to try to help? Uh, address health equity and, and in particular build trust with populations who have uh, deservedly mistrust the people who are, uh, who, who, are uh, who are supposed to serve them. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's such an important question. And, and, you know, to your point about the book and me being optimistic, uh, I'm optimistic here again, right? I mean, we've had, you know, uh, health disparity challenges in this country for decades, if not centuries. We've had structural racism. I think it's so important that the sort of average American also sees that problem now. Um, and I think that we're all, frankly, talking about it. Um, and I see that even from the employer side, I mean, I, I'll talk to employers, even big tech companies, the first one or two things they want to talk to me about is like, how do we improve health equity? And I think that that, that, that creates this sort of catalytic moment. Now, what do we do with that moment is, is the next question, right? But I, I do think that that's, that is important to recognize. I think on the solutions, I mean, to me, it goes back to that same framework, right? Of distributed, digitally enabled and decentralized and starting with distributed, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I think I didn't fully appreciate until the pandemic, right, is that, you know, so much of us are passionate about quality improvement, right, and, and we'll typically, you know, like my, my favorite topic, colon cancer screening, right, so we'll say, okay, we want to screen for colon cancer, it's very important, it's evidence-based, and, and how do we solve that problem? Well, you know, we'll start in our clinics, we'll say, hey, let's have our medical assistants ask about it more, let's add a little widget to the EMR that flags for me, let's train the doctors, let's have these little packages, well, 
guess what? All of those things start and end in a clinic. And so if we say that 20 to 40% of Americans don't have a doctor and don't go to clinic, we say that in underserved communities, we don't have clinics or we don't, they don't have trust in the clinics that are there. Well, that means by definition, all those innovations and improvements which are very important will actually not only not improve health equity, will actually exacerbate health equity. Right. And so we got to get out of the four walls of our institutions, right? And if I look at say the vaccine rollout, again, as optimistic view, that if we had just decided like we do for everything else, shingles and pneumonia vaccines, like, hey, let's just push it through the clinics. I don't think we'd have the progress that we have seen today, right? The fact that we went to football stadiums and churches and to grocery stores and to the bar for, for a free beer, right? Like th those, all those things in concert, I'm not saying in replacement of clinic-based vaccination, in concert with that is what ultimately now allowed us to, to move much faster with the vaccine rollout. That is a muscle we've built. Now the question is, how do we continue to, to, to leverage that muscle going forward so that you know, we're getting out of the clinics, distributing care, and thereby uh, reducing uh, health disparities. Well, um, that is a, a really powerful perspective of recognizing that uh, if all the investments are going to be in existing healthcare institutions, and we know that lots of people are not accessing those institutions, and in fact, in a disparate way, um, yeah, that it will amplify uh, equity issues for sure. That That, that is a powerful observation and a, and a call to come to a different way to do it. Well, uh, I want to be sure that uh, people who are attending this webinar have a chance to talk to you directly. Uh, so you can raise your hand or use the chat function. Uh, and um, if you raise your hand, our, our team will unmute you and spotlight you and everybody will get to see who you are and, and that you're here. And, uh, and you can ask uh, a question for either of us on any of the things that we've talked about. And again, I want as to people you. As people are thinking, uh, I'm going to ask a question of Shatnu. Um, so uh, around the equity issue and people uh, that don't have access to technology, that, that issue of the uh, uh, digital divide, uh, both from access to a point of view and a literacy point of view, what do you do about that? And what do you do when your clients don't have this kind of access? Yeah, yeah, such an important question. Thanks for asking it. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, I think when I, that's part of the reason why I prefer the frame distributed, right? Because I think people forget when they talk about virtual or talk about online or, or telemedicine, they forget the principle, which is meet people where they are. If you're online, great, let's meet you there. If you're not, we also have to meet you. And I think a little bit of the industry has gotten carried away with an alternative one size fits all model, which I don't think is the right approach. So that's sort of the first thing. And the reality is in some communities, that means we're gonna have to go to people's homes. We're gonna have to go to churches and barbershops. We're gonna have to, you know, technology cannot solve this problem. Meeting people where they are can solve this problem. So that's the first most important point I can make, Daniel. I think after that, the digital divide has three components, right? It's broadband access, device access, and digital literacy. And you need all three, but that I think sometimes when I talk to employers or clinics, they feel really um, disempowered to address uh, the digital divide, but that's because they're thinking about the broadband connectivity, which is really more of a policy whole society approach. I think there's a lot of good examples of where um, clinics and, and other organizations have solved the device or the literacy issues, right? So for example, when I was on the South side of Chicago uh, and was taking care of folks with diabetes, I, I built a text messaging base to so talk about digital enablement, a text messaging based uh, self-management support system. And when we enrolled folks, you know, we had a number of folks who actually didn't know how to text message. Uh, and so we just baked that into how we uh, enrolled them in the program was teaching them. And what was really funny is when we actually sat down with these folks a couple months later and said, you know, what'd you think? How was the program? And, you know, people say, yeah, yeah it's great that my diabetes is better, but I get to text message my grandkids now. <laughs> right. So, um, so, 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 so some of those other divides, you know, are more addressable at sort of the clinic physician level. And I think that there's a lot of those types of examples now, many more than mine, of around how they've been able to address that. So Wary uh, has a question for you. Oh, great. 
Dr. Nani, thank you very much. I think that what you're doing is really unique, and especially when it's coming from a physician. Um, I was just wondering in terms of this model that you were working with and implementing. Um, I, I work with tribal communities, American Indian tribal communities, and they live in reservations that are poverty ridden, most of them are, and transportation is not available. The roads and the infrastructure is not uh, up to standard. Would a model of this type work in a rural area? Yeah, thanks so much, Larry, for the work you're doing and for the question. Um, and, and I believe so. You know, I think part of the challenge that I see, so for, you know, we have, we work with employers, we also work with veterans. Uh, uh, we also are working with uh, the Choctaw Nation um, in Texas as well. And, and I think what I've seen is that part of what we're trying to solve for is complexity, right? Like, in a lot of these communities, you know, there are a lot of resources, not enough, but there's a lot of resources that people just don't know, frankly, how to navigate from point A to point B, right? They don't even know that those resources exist. Like I, I remember um, during the pandemic, um, just <laughs> an experience that really broke my heart was uh, I had this patient who I've had for a while and she came to the clinic and said, Dr. Nani, I really need your help. And I said, yeah, you know, of course, what, what's on your mind? And she said, can you sign, can you sign a letter for me that says that I should qualify for a hotel program because I'm, as you know, I'm homeless and I have diabetes. And that would qualify me to get into a hotel program. And uh, my heart broke. Uh, I didn't know she was homeless. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, and I'll say further that I knew like on NPR, right? I knew that these hotel programs were being stood up because of the pandemic. I didn't know I had one in my own county. And so I wrote, you know, my, my hands were literally trembling. I wrote what to me was like the most powerful prescription I ever wrote, which was saying that here, this woman should, should, should be able to go to a hotel. And, um, and for me, I think, you know, as I was driving home that day, I just kept thinking, man, how many more patients of mine could I, could get, could I get a good night's sleep for? And, um, and that's an example of that complexity. And so I think part of what we're trying to bring with some of these virtual models or these sort of call center based models, or even if you want to call it a, a health worker led model, where it's a health assistant, not a physician or a nurse, is really being able to, to at for people really simplify that experience. And in that way, get them into the resources that are already available into their communities, um, in part by building that trust with them, and then being able to then say, hey, there is something for you that I think will really help you in this situation. And so I, I believe that there's an opportunity um, in, in communities like yours as well. So thank you. Um, where, uh, Lloyd, um, could you say your comment out loud and then maybe we'll be followed with Candace who had a similar sentiment. Lloyd? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we, we got gotcha. you. Okay. Well, first, thank you for, the, for all the lovely work. And I'm actually piling on here about the ideas of really building on the groups that are already in the community. And connecting with them, supporting them in doing the work with us, or uh, maybe we're doing their work. Community health workers would be the model example in North Carolina. They've been just pivotal in responding to COVID and we're looking at them as a long-term solution to deal with some of our equity issues. But sometimes it's CHW, sometimes it's agricultural extension agents, which proved to be really trusted. And to the tribal community, again, it varies with the Lumbees in Eastern North Carolina. It's really working through the their structures and systems. I think the key issue that you said so well is let's build on what already is, is um, I should add the faith community, of course. Uh, let's build on what's already in the community that's already trusted and connect and support them as a way of doing our work together. And if I said anything you'd say better, please correct me. Oh, that was pretty good, Larry. I'm gonna borrow that. No, I, I, I could not could not agree more uh, with your comments. You know, I had a chance to work with community health workers in India and Mozambique as part of my work at the World Bank, and I think it's a highly underutilized, um, you know, model. And um, you know, I think part of what I think if you think about sort of this idea of rearchitecting care, which is kind of what I'm talking about, right? Like really starting first principles. I think we haven't necessarily done ourselves a service by saying that everything has to start with a primary care physician. Right, I think we have a very, sometimes I call it an asset-based view of primary care, which is, oh, primary care equals clinics, equals primary care physicians with an MD, equals 
you know, medical home. And I think, you know, from Barbara Starfield and from folks who helped pioneer the field of primary care, it's, it's a much more functional view, which is it's the four C's, first contact, coordinated, comprehensive, and uh, continuous. And so the question to me really is to achieve those four functions in these various communities, who is best equipped to do that? Uh, the function matters, not necessarily the asset, right? And so I think just adding to your point, really piling on on your pile on that, like, I completely agree uh, that we need to look at the type of worker. One five second addition is we say primary care is a team sport. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Candace, anything you want to add to that? Uh, your, your comment was along those lines. Candace? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, and I so appreciate uh, listening to you today because, you know, understand uh, cultural communities and remember that it's not one size fit all. You know, one person on one block is not the same as the other person on the other block, although they might be the same nationality. And I, I think so often that is so misunderstood. And so it's and so I say that having culturally um, um, uh, appropriate uh, community workers, though, that means that they need to understand the taboos of that community, the religious barriers of that community, the community barriers of that community. So that's what makes community engagement and community health workers that vital because they understand the nuances. So not just going in and go, hey, we're gonna save you. You're not, if you don't understand what's going on within that community. So I really appreciate uh, the information that you shared today and the great work that you're doing. Thank you, Ken. Um, yeah, uh, Terry? You. Terry's got a question for you, Shantanu. Yeah. Terry, or uh, take yourself Hi. off mute, maybe. Hi, I actually had two questions. I guess my first one would be, um, you mentioned in your book that you have a, a part of your workforce that trains patients and families to use tech in order to better partner with healthcare providers. Um, would you suggest that as a basis for a program, maybe for high schoolers that are being trained to be introduced into healthcare careers? Wow. I, I love that idea. It goes back to what Lloyd said, you know, team-based care, you know, and absolutely. I think that they would, I, I can tell you my seven-year-old, whenever my Zoom doesn't work, I just call her. So. Right. They uh, get it really fast. <laughs> so I have absolutely. one more, if I can Please. speak in the um, next one. Do you have, um, what suggestions do you have for changing the current and long-standing drive to continuously try to convince people in communities that are mistrustful of healthcare professionals to get a primary care provider. Clearly they're mistrustful of the system. They're mistrustful of healthcare. They may be mistrustful of the hospital that's in their area. So at what point do we be in, begin to try to create a new model where instead of pushing people towards that primary care provider, it, it, it's, it just seems to, um, kind of perpetuate that whole patriarchal system that's within healthcare. Like if you just find a doctor and listen to that doctor, you'll be fine. But there are other people within healthcare that can help you to maintain, that can help you. How do we work with, I guess, the decision makers within our healthcare organizations to realize that we have to start to look at something different? Yeah. Wow. You said a lot there, Terry. And, and I think your the spirit of what you're saying, I completely agree with, uh, you know, I, and there's a lot that I could say to that. I'm sure Dr. Perrin would add some stuff as well. But to, to me, I think the starting point is, uh, and I'm going to go back to COVID. I really see this as a catalytic moment, right? Our whole country, our economy, which matters a lot to this country, it all just got turned on its head and healthcare got turned on its head, right? Like mm -hmm. insurance companies made a bunch of money last year, Doctors were being applauded, you know, and nurses on the streets of New York City at 5 p.m., right? We're talking about health equity. We're talking about mental health crisis. Like, I think that this is, this is a moment. And I think what I find helpful is telling the stories and telling the stories about what we learned during the pandemic. Because people, even if you're not a doctor, not a nurse, not in healthcare, people remember that visceral experience of like, in the first couple of months, how do I get a test? People remember calling that service 20 times, trying to get a vaccine in those early weeks for, for their mother or for themselves. Use that, use that and use the examples of 
of like some of the stuff I talked about, you know, the, the vaccine effort and the, the collaboration with the churches, the, the feet on the street, people went canvassing, getting people signed up. Um, give those examples. And, you know, then people are sort of, so they sort of hit the emotion. They're like, yes, I didn't think about that. And then you think, so then why are we now going back to the old normal? Right. And why are we now then again, expecting people just to show up on our doorstep and, you know, listen to everything we have to say? Right. And if you, I, I'm finding if I'm drawing that arc for people, people are saying, oh, yeah. And, and it's also, I think, empowering too to say, like, this idea I've been telling people, you've been built, you built a new muscle, right? That mm -hmm. I sometimes joke that the healthcare system, we all just got a master's in public health over the past 18 mm -hmm. months, right? Uh, we have muscles today that we didn't have 18 months ago. And I'm so thankful we have it. The question is, what are you going to do with it? But if you help people see that and you help them see, hey, you know, you, you figured out how to do a drive through test. I'm talking about another kind of drive through, or you mm -hmm. figured out how to, you know, fill your clinic when people were too afraid to come, right? If you then build on them and say, hey, but that same thing, you know what? We can get people their shingle shot. You know, that same church, we can go set up a blood pressure drive there. I think, you know, have, helping people see that they've already taken those steps and that they're already two steps forward. Um, I think can really help them because sometimes they want to maybe do the right thing, but they just feel lost and they feel overwhelmed and helping them see that we're already on that path. We just got to keep going. Uh, Bill Adams, you've had several uh, comments. Do you want to talk about your last comment? Maybe he's not with no, us. I, no, I'm there he is. To hear, um, I wasn't prepared to talk about my last comment. That's why I put it in there. Uh, <laughs> No, my last comment actually was paraphrasing of Victor Montori, <clears throat> who is an endocrinologist and who's done a lot of work in shared decision-making and his current work is called The Patient Revolution. But he talks about um, caring for this patient, not patients like this. And it, it mm -hmm. just, so what you said so resonated with that concept, uh, getting to know the patients in their own space, in their own environment, um, just absolutely, absolutely fantastic. One of the things that I didn't put in the chat that I've been thinking about is how community and the clinic can become one so that the clinic isn't sort of a separate building over here, which operates from whatever in the morning to whatever in the afternoon or evening. But using that facility to be part of the community and the community feeling that that facility is, is part of them. So it's not, not all medicalized. <clears throat> the community can, can feel a part of that facility. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, love, I love both of those points. Um, you know, I think of the first one, uh, one of my mentors told me every patient has a story, right? Uh, you know, there's everybody has their own barriers. Everyone has their own story. And if you have to get to know that story, you can't assume things from people, regardless of what race or background they come from. And on the second, I totally agree. You know, Paul Farmer, who, um, who helped found Partners in Health and has worked on HIV AIDS around the country, he talks about community-based health center enriched. And that was like really hit me because I was kind of like, I always thought, okay, clinic-based with some community, but like, he's like, no, community-based health center enriched. And we're starting to see some of those models like Oak Street Health, which has gotten a lot of attention, right? Like they have the sort of the Zumba, you know, classes and the cooking classes. And it's, you know, they locate it in a busy thoroughfare, not just on some medical campus far away. Like, I think you're starting to see that, but you're, you're right that there's way more we can do. 